All right, hopefully everybody can hear me. Good afternoon. My name is Kathy Ullman. I will move around a bunch because for one thing, I know it's 3 o'clock. I know it happens to me at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Even if I'm really engaged and I really want to hear what somebody has to say at 3 o'clock, my brain goes, and I feel like a wind-up doll. So I'm going to move around, and hopefully that will help keep everybody awake. I also am hoping uh, to engage you guys and um, it not just be the only one talking. So if you think you're going to just sit quietly, I, I, I kind of hope you don't. So here's the agend agenda for today. Um, we're gonna, you're going to meet the sloth. You'll see what that means. We're going to talk about the motivation, why this is such an important topic. We're going to talk about some strengths and weaknesses in information security. And by InfoSec, I literally mean a very broad spectrum of thing, right? So not just people who blue team, not just people who red team, but everybody who works in this industry, we're going to see some strengths and weaknesses. And then we're going to talk about communications on multiple levels within an organization, because I think that's a really important topic, and we'll see why. We're also going to talk about nonverbals. We talk, sometimes there is conversation about communication, and we talk a lot about the right kinds of things to say, but what about the things you're not saying? So we're going to talk about that too. Um, and then I've got some final thoughts. As we go along, if you have questions, please feel free to jump in and ask. I, uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say. So with that, here's the sloth. This sloth's name is Minnie. She was my adopted sloth at the Buffalo Zoo up until a few years ago. And I'm a huge fan of sloths, so uh, I often put this as the slide of me. But really, this is me, OK? I have been at the University of Buffalo a very, very long time. I started in on the support side of things and over time moved into security. I have some degrees. I have some certifications. I know a few things, but I don't know everything. Um, in fact, I come to these things to learn just as much as anybody else. So. Please feel free if you hear me talk about something and you think it should be corrected. I'm very open to hearing what you have to say. So why is this topic important? You should probably care about this. Because what are the odds of being impacted by some kind of nasty breach? They're pretty good, right? I mean, if we look at these numbers alone, we can see that the breaches themselves started going up. Then they started going down, but so this sort of seems like maybe this is a good thing, right? Only 281 breaches through April, but look at the record numbers. That, that's not so good. So how many of you deal with incident response on a regular basis? At least a few of you, okay. So this is kind of your world, right? You're dealing with breaches and you're dealing with unpleasant stuff. How many of you are on the other side of the house either uh, trying to break into stuff or, you know, ideally for money, but maybe sometimes not? At least a couple, okay. What do the rest of you do? Read the news, okay. Fair. Anything else? Communications, yeah, okay. Important stuff. Anybody else? Tools. Do you write them or do you you maintain them? Okay, excellent. What else? Anybody else want to? Yeah. Change management. Okay. So you'll find that this is this is fairly relevant to all of you. It's going to touch all of you in very different ways depending on the role that you play within your organization. But the odds are pretty good re regardless because look at last year alone, right? Two to three billion records ish. And if you look at this little bottom bullet here, so that's 1.68 billion non-sensitive on top of the sensitive stuff. So what do we think of as sensitive? Well, credit cards, right, passport numbers, social security numbers, that's all really sensitive data. What about the stuff that seems non-sensitive? Does that matter? Who said yes? Why? Okay, but that could be considered sensitive potentially for the company. What about other less interesting stuff? Go ahead. Right. 
Yeah. So the data that's out there, things like who brings the donuts to the office, if that person doesn't come in that day, they're out sick, and you find out they're out sick, and you want to, say, get into that company, maybe you're so-and-so's friend, and you're bringing in the donuts, right? So just because data appears to be sensitive in nature doesn't necessarily mean that, or I'm sorry, that is not sensitive in nature doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't matter. In many cases, if you take that non-sensitive data and you pull enough of it together, you can correlate some really interesting things about a company that maybe they don't want you to know. So this is a pretty famous quote. Um, obviously, this guy's been in the news a lot. And no matter what you think about him, uh, personally or professionally, I think his statement is pretty accurate, that basically companies either are breached or they're going to be breached or they're going to be breached again because that's just the nature of this business. So let's talk a little bit about our strengths and weaknesses. What are we particularly good at? Well, first of all, consider this. Consider that this is not necessarily just a technological problem. And again, whether or not you like this particular individual or think what he has to say is interesting, I think this quote merits some thought, right? If you think that technology is the be-all, end-all to your security problems, then you may not understand that problem. Because as we're seeing, human beings play a bigger and bigger role in all of this, right? So keep that in mind, and that's where this communication part is going to be really critical. So this is what we're really good at doing. We fix stuff. We break stuff. We deal with the technology stuff, right? This is what we do. This is what we're not so good at. Yeah. We're not so good at the humaning. We're pretty good at the computing stuff. How often do you find yourself, if you're ever in a support type role, thinking, oh my goodness, they're so dumb. Ugh. Does anybody think that? Who's in a support role at all? Do you ever think those things? Yeah, right, and, and you know, I can attest to this, right? I, too, have been there. It gets very frustrating. But the reality is, if you're talking about, let's say, a CFO, right, or you're talking about a marketing manager, is it their job to know what you know about computing? What's their job? Whatever their job is, right? So if it's the... The CFO, they better know finances. If they're marketing, they better know the marketing stuff. I mean, that's what they're paid to know. You're paid to know technology. And so just as we get frustrated with them because they don't necessarily understand the stuff we understand, I guarantee you if you try to have a conversation with them about what they know, they will be equally as frustrated. And that's kind of important to understand. How about patience? When we're in those situations, are we patient? Yes, we're so patient, right? The impatience, it thrives. It's really easy to lose your patience when you're like, for the 27th time, just click the icon. And they're going, what icon? I don't know what you're talking about. How many people do phone support for their parents or other relatives? <laughs> right? Been there, done that. I am incredibly fortunate because part of the reason that I work in this industry is that my father was director of computing services at the college where I grew up. And so I've had this stuff in my house my entire life. And he is not somebody I have to do technical support for. Yay! Um, my mother lives in Atlanta, and my brother is the one closest to her. Also not my problem. But I do get the phone call occasionally from my uncle, who is the lawyer, who says, can you help me with this? And since my first divorce, he helped me for free, hoping I will never have a second one, I give in and I give him some help. So what are the repercussions? Well, there are a lot of them. You're going to lose trust. If you're not patient with people and you lose your temper and it's very easy to think negative things about these folks, you're going to start creating this negative atmosphere. Even if you're not necessarily actually saying things out loud, the thoughts in your own mind are pervasive. And they're going to affect what you do because those thoughts start to create beliefs. And those beliefs continue to affect thoughts, and those thoughts and beliefs ultimately affect actions. 
So the more frustrated you get, and the more you feed that onto yourself, the worse you're gonna find. So you could find that you're gonna have additional conflict, you're gonna have uh, a negative potential reputation problem if you, you know, can't uh, work things out with people. Uh, you could have a decrease in morale because people just get so frustrated. I didn't have a chance to add this in, but I actually have a friend uh, who was ranting on Facebook about her IT department. And I, I asked her, I said, you know, can I use this for future presentations? She said, absolutely. She was very frustrated because the guy that she was working with would not come up and see what the problem was. She kept trying to describe it, but she was having a really difficult time explaining what it was that she was seeing that she, it didn't make any sense to her. And instead of him saying, okay, I'm gonna come up and I'm gonna take a look, or, or you know, connecting in and, and looking at her machine and trying to be patient with her, he was, he just refused. And so she just had nothing good to say about her IT. She's like, this is why I hate AT. I can't blame her. Causes lots of elevated stress. Causes stress for you, causes stress for the person you're trying to help. All right, so now the part you've been waiting for. All right, there's been an intrusion, there's been an infection, there's been some of this. Anybody seen these? I mean, most people have seen this in the news, even if they haven't seen it on a machine. I've seen it on at least a handful of machines at the university. Uh, the very first time a department called me and said, hey, we have this, what do we do? I really, really had to try not to laugh and say, do you have any backups? And she said no. And I said, then I'm very sorry, any data on that machine, you can kiss goodbye. There's nothing we can do to help you. And they were like, but your security, you're supposed to be able to help us. And I said, I, I'm sorry, you know, that this is what this does to these machines. And I had to be very patient and very calm with her. And, you know, let's see what, where we can get maybe some of this data from elsewhere, but there was nothing I could do to help her. Now what, right? Now we're in a bad situation. We are the cats walking away from the explosion. Except we can't walk away from the explosion. Okay, panic. We're gonna panic, we're gonna freak out. This is really tempting. Just flipping out, oh no, what are we gonna do? Not really productive. This is not really what you're supposed to do, right? You're, especially if you're doing something like an incident response, this is kind of the opposite of the attitude they want you to have, because if you freaked out at every incident, I don't think you'd last long. So instead, we're gonna talk to people. And no matter what your role is within your organization, I guarantee you're gonna be talking about any incident that happens in your organization. Whether you're part of the incident response process, you're just a user in that environment, you're you know, helping with software in an environment, you're doing communication, it doesn't matter. You're gonna play some role in that. So this is supposed to be kind of generic. To, we're gonna talk about three levels within your organization, and not all of this may apply to each and every one of you every time, but you will find that there are pieces of this that I would be surprised if it didn't apply to all of you at some point. So here are your audiences. We're gonna do what's called frame the conversation. So these are the three levels that I was talking about, the end user, mid manager, and C level. And the first thing is you need to try to anticipate what these different levels are gonna ask. Because you're not gonna know for sure, but based on kind of what they do and, and their role within the organization, you might be able to, to kind of guess some of this stuff. Because the more you can have prepared to answer, the better off you're gonna be. So how are you going to communicate this information to them? Consider the channel. If somebody's gotten into your network, is it really a good idea to be sending an email out about that? Because what are the odds the bad guy's watching? I wouldn't want to do that, right? So maybe email in that particular instance isn't your, a good channel. Maybe a company-wide meeting isn't appropriate because maybe you don't want the whole company to know all of the details, but it might be. So each one of these channels, you have to consider What's going on? This is all gonna be context driven. So depending on the context of the situation and your company and your environment, that's gonna drive a lot of this. Uh, my favorite, of course, is you might wanna use lawyer approved carrier pigeons. So your end user, right? Cute. Okay, so your end user, they're typically focused on what they need to get done during the day. 
That's their focus. They want to make sure they can get their job done. Anything that impacts that is going to be problematic. If you can communicate both the what and the why, it doesn't mean you have to tell them every single detail, and I guarantee they don't want to know. Because the level of technical detail that most of you will understand is so far above where they are, they don't want that level of information. They want to understand the what happened and why at their level in a way that makes sense to them. And that doesn't mean talking down to them, which is when we get impatient, the thing that most of us want to try to do. In some cases, you want to try to use this as an opportunity for awareness training. So in the case of ransomware, it's frequently somebody clicks on something they probably shouldn't have, and now a machine gets infected. Or in the case of, like I said, the first instance we had of this, it was an entire departmental drive. Right? So this is not ideal. Now we have a whole department that's down. Pointing fingers at this point, not helpful, not even remotely. That doesn't mean that we don't want to figure out who started this and talk to them and educate them. Again, this is an opportunity for awareness training. So even for the people who didn't do it, we still want to educate them on this is how it happened, and, but not necessarily say, well, Johnny did this and Sally did that. No. More like, this is probably what happened. This thing got infected. This is how it happened, and this is what you can take away from this. So takeaways for their level. So we're going to talk about effective and efficient communications and what that entails. And it should be continuous. We tend to blast messages out and then stop. How many of you have ever gotten a message, an email, uh, uh, let's see, a forum thread, anything about a topic you were super interested in, and you heard like, you got like lots of information in the very beginning. You hear like, I don't know, five or six different threads or emails, and all of a sudden, nothing. Is that frustrating? I find that incredibly frustrating. And I guarantee your end users are going to be like, oh my god, we talked all about this, like this huge thing, and then all of a sudden it was just gone. Then, they, then you feel like you're in the dark. Maybe they're purposely not telling you something. This really is not a good idea. So how does one effectively and efficiently communicate? Well, you're going to be precise, and you're going to be concise. Keep it short. Like I said, they don't need to know every single detail in this case. That's not important. They need to know what's relevant to them. Be judicious. So again, if Sally is the one who clicked on the link and caused the problem, they don't need to know that Sally did that. That's not necessarily important. What's important is that there was somebody who clicked on something, this is the outcome, and now this is how it's going to impact you for the next however long it's going to impact you. Those are the more important things. And be patient. Oh my goodness, if you have to go to a closet and scream your head off after you're done, scream your head off. Nothing wrong with that. Then come back in, deep breath, meditating, you know, uh, inhalings, whatever it is you need. But try really hard to be patient because people are usually freaking out at this point at every level. So this is what I've been alluding to multiple times. You need to talk to people in a way that they can understand on their level. So if it's something that they can relate to, so if you have to tell them a story, tell them a story. Stories go a long way. This is how we don't want to communicate with end users, or frankly, anybody else. This goes badly. So engagement is key. You're going to want to stay engaged with them. Like I said, you don't want to just drop the ball. You want to make sure that all of the things that you're telling them that you sort of follow through to the end. So when things are restored and back up to normal or you've rebuilt or whatever it is that you've had to do within your organization, let them know. We've, we've recovered from this. Here's where we are. Uh, you know, something so that they don't feel like they were left hanging and in the dark. Because otherwise, you're going to breed some discomfort. And when you breed discomfort, you get fear. And fear is not good in this business. I have a whole other talk about that uh, that I'll be giving at Circle City Con. So this whole idea of addressing potential fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Anticipate that you're going to have people who are terrified. Both the person who probably did the action is terrified because of the ramifications of that. But even the people who didn't, you know, they, they don't know. They don't understand necessarily what's going on. So anticipate there's going to be a certain level of that fear. And 
honestly, perception for, the, for these folks, that's reality. It doesn't matter if we all know, yeah, this is how this really worked. Their perception is their reality. So you have to find a way to deal with that. Even if you know, the, their perception is way off, you're going to have to find a way to explain to them that I understand this is what you observed, and I understand you're very uncomfortable about that. So you know, how can I help? And sometimes they'll be able to tell you, well, just explain this to me. Oh, all right. Um, even if you know something's not a problem, do you know? Listen, give it a best effort to investigate it so that it doesn't seem like you're blowing them off. All right, mid-level management. So we have our mid-managers. Everybody, calm down. So they're usually focused on your business processes, and that's going to depend greatly on what they're a manager of. So we talked about the difference between, you know a marketing person and a finance person and an HR person, all of that, even IT, right? It's all going to be different. You're going to, again, you're going to speak at a level they can understand and relate to. And they're probably not going to know a whole lot more about IT unless they're an IT manager than your end users. So you may be telling them, in some cases, the same sorts of things you're telling your end users. You're going to use that effective and efficient communications again and you're not going to do this. Oh no, it's the end of the world, bad thing happened, chicken with my head cut off. And you're not going to give them no useful information in the same way that you're going to help your end user to understand what's happened, how it, why it happened, and how it happened. You're going to do that same thing for mid-level management. So this is a skill set for an ideal manager. Pretty good list, right? Good delegation skills, pretty good at interpersonal stuff. They can communicate, communicate well. They can negotiate stuff. They have high level of emotional intelligence. And they can be pretty good influencers. Who here has ever met a middle manager that meets those qualifications? Ooh, look at all those hands. Oh, one hand. So you've met one of these. That's impressive. Usually I don't get any hands because usually uh, <clears throat> This is where we would find the middle manager. So what makes you, this manager for you so fabulous that, that they really have all that skill set? Did they just have a wide background? Yeah. <laughs> Which can go either way, right? I mean, because you can have some of those skills or you can have all of those skills, but with the military background, sometimes um, they are very rigid in their thinking. So that can go either way. But this is often what I find with the whole idea of an ideal mid-level manager. So we've got to engage with the regular ones, since most of, most of us aren't so lucky as to have an ideal mid-level manager in our midst. We need to support these folks. This is our job. No matter what it is you do, be kind to them. Everybody below a mid-level manager wants to be where they are. They want to move up and everybody who's above them is trying to keep them down. It is a crappy place to be. Even if they love what they do, it's still, it's stressful. It's, this, there's a reason why they're that mid-level manager, right? So empathy is key. You need to be empathetic. You need to realize that they are, they are being pulled in multiple directions. So what can we do for them? We can make them look good. So you're going to work with mid-level managers in many cases, and you're going to develop a plan for their units. And the plan needs to include a lot of these things. It needs to include all your stakeholders, of course, what happened exactly, what your time frame recovery options are like. Um, you know, is this going to happen again? Is it likely to happen anytime soon? And what's your end goal, and how are you going to get there? So if you're doing incident response, the last thing you want to do is show up in, with the chicken with the head cut off thing and go, oh no, sky is falling, bad thing happened. No, you want to show up and you want to say, the bad thing happened, here's what it was, and here's our game plan. And you're going to work with them to figure this out. You're not going to just show up with everything you know, pre-connected in your brain because you don't know everything they know. But you need to realize all these pieces have to be in place so you can help them look good, right? That's kind of this whole idea that I, I mentioned before. Now, going back to when I said we don't want to blame people, 
This is true. Publicly, we do not want to blame the folks who make the mistakes. This doesn't buy anybody anything. However, management do need to take responsibility for their people. So the reality is, if a manager has somebody who's a problem child, they need to help figure out the best way to handle that. There is no 100% guarantee that you're going to be able to mitigate every single risk for every user out there. But there are ways when you have somebody who just always clicks the thing to minimize the potential impact on the rest of a company. And they need to know who those people are. And in some cases, this is how they find out, right? So these are some questions that you should be considering if you are doing IR. Ransom payments. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that have not had this conversation within their company. So what happens if they get something that you absolutely have to have? Or you've done your backups and you go to do the restore and it's just gone. Have you had the conversation about are you willing to do this? Because there's a lot of detail involved. Who's paying? How are they paying? How is this going to play out? Or straight up, we're just not paying and we're willing to just say we don't have this data anymore. And of course, there's no guarantee even if you pay, you're going to get this data back, right? But the reality is that conversation should not be happening the day that you're in the middle of an incident because it's too late then. I mean, not that you can't have that conversation, but that's problematic. So you also want to talk about talk with them about whether they should be delegating. Are they going to play the role of a coach? H how, is, how are they going to fit into this bigger picture? So your C-suite. Think about 30 seconds on an elevator because that's about the amount of time they're usually going to give you. And even if they give you more, the important things you have to say to them should fit within this 30 seconds, which doesn't mean you fly through them. It means, again, being very concise they're going to look at this big picture. They're going to look at you know, the whole company performance. These are the, the vision. These are the things they're really focused on. They don't care about day-to-day -day details. Typically, they're so far removed from that, they, it's just not important to them. So again, you need to frame this conversation so that it's interesting for them and, and something worthwhile. Again, non-technical descriptions, unless you're talking to a CIO who happens to be super technical. I can tell you that our CIO is not super technical. He's just not. Does he have some technical background? Yeah. So if you say the word router, he doesn't look at you like you have four heads. But I'll tell you right now that he wouldn't understand an incident. If, if we had any sort of major incident, he wouldn't know. So you're still, in many ways, talking like you would with the end user, except instead of focusing on the day-to-day -day stuff, you're going to look at this bigger picture. He's gonna, he or she is going to want to know best case, worst case scenario type stuff because, again, this is the big picture. And, you know, consequences. Are we likely to see this again? No geek speak. There's going to be just about nobody at your C-level. Now, I'm, I, I say just about because I do know that there are companies that sometimes have C-suite folk who are very technical and very competent, and that's awesome. But by and large, your C-suite doesn't know technology. And so if you walk in there and you start talking about various ransomware, they may not even know what ransomware is. Despite the fact that it's been in the news and people use this lingo every day, I can't tell you many people, I've used the word malware, and they look at me and they're like, I don't know what that is. So then I have to explain to them, well, does mal think, make you think of good or bad? And then usually I sort of walk them through, oh, yeah, okay, bad. Okay, so... It, you know, some bad software on the system and it does bad things. And depending on the level of the person, I can get more or less technical. But they don't necessarily, even though they've heard the words, they may not understand what you're talking about. So using that uh, plain English is important. Do your homework. Understand if you're, if you're part of the company, by all means, you should be researching and understanding the goals of your company. Don't be a silo. If you're going in as a... Um, as a third-party contractor, you really want to do your homework so that you understand what's important to that C-suite. You know, what is the goal of the company? What have they been doing? You should be doing that before meeting with them. That's why you only get that 30 seconds in an elevator to give them this little bit of information that they need to understand. You're going to enter and exit gracefully no matter how frustrated you are. You're not going to blow up at them. 
You're not going to get frustrated with them, at least not visually. And remember, ultimately, these are people too. Um, I know that some people see the C-suite as so high up that they forget that they usually have a family and kids and people they go home to. Not all of them, but some. Your CFO, they're going to be interested in numbers and metrics. They're going to be all about the money. Um, they often know a lot of legal stuff. Use their knowledge to your benefit. Work with them. Because if they know some laws or uh, you know, the, the, the different kinds of um, uh, rules that govern your particular business, that can impact greatly how you're going to go forward with this, right? So your COO, there's different kinds of COOs, so there's some considerations here about you know, which kind of COO you're talking to. Uh, again, this whole idea of framing the conversation. I won't spend a lot of time here. All right. Now, how do we know if what we've told them, them meaning any one of these levels, gets through? Right? It's tough to tell. One way is by nonverbal communication. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to pay attention to body language. Body language is critical. Body language includes a lot of things. These are the sort of typical things. So your, your, your gesture, your posture, um, whether you're making eye contact, how you shake hands, breathing. There are a lot of different factors. I'm keeping this very brief. There, I could go into this in great detail. Uh, the folks who do social engineering pay really close attention to this stuff. And it's really useful in just about every level of the field. So the, there are nonverbal cues. These are pretty standard examples. So raised eyebrows, right? So with any one of these nonverbal cues, you can interpret them differently. So if I raise my eyebrows, am I surprised about something? Or am I doubting what you're telling me? Could go either way, right? Kind of depends. And we see that for a lot of these other gestures. If I'm sitting like this, Am I sitting like this because it's freaking cold in the room? Or am I sitting like this because I'm not listening to a word you say? And the point of this is that we can't look at any one of these and go, oh, I understand the picture now. We have to take them all together. So we have to do what's called synthesize these verbal cues. So this is just one example. So reading a person, if you take raised eyebrows and maybe fleeting eye movement, maybe a, you know, real hard grip on something, they're probably uncomfortable. So you need to look at all of these nonverbal cues as a collective. You can't take any one of these individually, and it's still possible to misinterpret what you're seeing. But pay attention, because people will tell you more than you realize by not saying a word. So with some final thoughts, our job in IT, and I don't care whether you're in security, whether you're in InfoSec, whether you're a hacker, whether you're red team, whether you're blue team, however it is you define your role in this industry, our job is to educate because we're the ones who understand this stuff. And they're not, as I started out in the beginning, these folks know what they know. You know what you know. Share that information, because without it, they'll never know. And find opportunities to share that information. I was able to share information. I had a colleague, another colleague with a Facebook post, who tried to, to say she was very frustrated because somebody had sent her an email that had an attachment, that had a password on the attachment, and it was redundant security. And I said, instead of saying, oh my god, you're so stupid, what do you, what, what do you mean? I thought, huh, I want to know more about this. And so public Facebook, I just asked her. I said, tell me more. I want to understand. Why do you feel that this is redundant? Tell me. And so she explained this whole thing about you know, the email and the password-protected document and that, gee, she had to log into her email. So I then had the opportunity to explain to her that by default, email's not secure. There's nothing secure about email by default. 
So yes, you log into your mailbox and that gives you access to your mailbox, but when you're sending a message, that message could be interpreted through other systems, it bounces between machines, there's often no protection whatsoever and she was shocked, she had no idea. Again, I know what I know and she doesn't. So once I explained it to her, she realized, oh, this isn't redundant at all. This actually makes a whole lot of sense. But you gotta look for those opportunities. Take a deep breath when somebody says something and the first thing you think is, ugh. Think, all right, why don't they understand that? Is it because of an age thing? Is it because, you know, this is just not their field? What is it that they're interested in? How can I relate this to them? I find all kinds of crazy ways, whether it's comic books or movies or TV shows, I find great ways to come up with ideas to explain things to people. And you have to be creative. So educate. Don't adjudicate. That's not our role. We're there to teach. And you can learn too. Because the more you understand about each one of these people and their role within an organization, the more you will have a better understanding of what they're trying to get done and how you can help them. From a security perspective, the way I look at it is our office, in the, the security office at the University of Buffalo, our goal is to help you do whatever it is you do at the university more safely. It's not to say no, it's not to get in your way, it's to help you be better at what you do and keep you safe. But we can't do it alone, so we have to partner with all of these people. For what it's worth, there are five people in my office and there are 35,000 people on our campus. There is no way we can do that by ourselves. And that's typically true in more, most organizations. So again, trade information, you'll be amazed what you learn. So be that change. Don't be that person who's the jerk. We can change IT in every capacity if we choose to change how we perceive other people. Questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. You can't see their face. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to me like for that person? Because even though we try to assume they are smart enough, like they don't know that. Okay. So I don't know, what is your uh, perception of the person that you're talking to? Are you talking to them verbally? Yes. Can you hear their frustration? Yeah. So in, those are going to be verbal cues. So you're going to listen in those cases for verbal cues. So for anybody who couldn't hear, the question had to do with how do you deal with the situation where you're doing incident response in a, at a distance and, in, and you're using like WebEx and you're not necessarily doing any kind of um, something with a camera. So you can't see their face, but you can hear their voice. So you're gonna hear that. The other thing you can do, uh, and I, I didn't talk about this a lot, but communication requires two ways. If you say stuff and that's that, you haven't communicated anything. So your best option is to communicate something small and ask for feedback. So if they say to you, um, we don't know what to do, ask them what they do understand. Start from a point of understanding and then you can either correct it and go forward or if they understand whatever it is, move to the next thing. Because sometimes we take chunks that are too big and that's why they don't understand. So, I mean, it's going to be different in each case, but especially when you hear somebody getting, like, levels of frustration, find ways to, to take a deep breath and step back and say, you know, I hear you're super frustrated and, you know, I want to help. How, how can I help? If they need to vent, let them vent. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, so, so part of why I said you want to have this um, exchange of information is that you want to go into a department and say, we want to teach you stuff. I have never done a presentation for a department who, uh, because typically the way it works is that I get asked to come in. But in many cases, I find out that there's been an issue in a department and, they, and they're frustrated. I say, well, how can I help? Can I come in and talk? And they're usually very interested in hearing what I have to say. And that gives me the opportunity to educate. So look for opportunities to educate. Awareness is certainly one of them. Just make sure that when you start building awareness, it's, it's got a positive spin. It's never about, I caught you doing this. You did the bad thing. How many people can we catch? Every time I hear somebody talking about a fishing campaign where they're doing in-house fishing and it's all based on negative stuff, this doesn't work. People will not learn anything. There has to be positive reinforcement. So I would absolutely recommend some sort of awareness thing, but make it positive. So figure out how what you're teaching them fits into their business practices and how it makes how it's relevant for them. They'll be way more interested in what you have to say and they'll hear you better. Does that help? Mm-hmm. So unfortunately, to a certain degree, that's going to be a, a policy decision within your organization. And what I have really stressed in our organization is I won't do fishing if it's, if it's got that kind of spin. Like, I will do a fishing campaign for you if you understand that. We're not going to point fingers at people. We're going to look at general trends. You're always going to have certain people that click on the thing. Giving additional training is okay, but you're going to get to a point where you know, okay, uh, Joe Q person over here or Jane Q person over there, they're always going to click the thing. At that point, instead of beating them to death with it, find other ways. Put, put stuff in a VM, like find other ways to mitigate that. But you're going to need probably some, some support above you to say, you know, you can gamify it. You can say for everybody who determines that this is bad, uh, you know, you get a, you get something and you collect so many and you win a prize or, you know, depending on your organization, if you can do something like that, that never hurts. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, so, so not only um, do you want to do that, but also tie it into why it matters at home because that's another thing that, that is a really positive, like, see, you didn't do it here. If you don't do it at home and you get in the habit of not doing it all the time, you'll be even safer at home. So, yeah, absolutely. Got a hand over here, yes. Yeah. So for those of you who, who may not have heard, the suggestion is in terms of communicating information, don't use the word but because what ends up happening is you cut the person off. If you use and, it allows for and continuation. So work with the choice of language that you're using and think carefully about that because you can absolutely turn people off. Yes. And that's, that speaks to what I was saying earlier about this idea that, you know, we're there to work with them. We're there to partner with them. We are not there to be the bad guy and simply say no. And we're going to do it together. Exactly. Yep. And you're always going to have, you know, you're always going to have people that will, will push back on you, but... You know, for the most part, that's, I think, very effective. Question over here. What do you think about all the, the rumor? It seems like there's a gamble on one hand in trying to keep the stress from kids. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they're like, I think we're not supposed to be using particular theories because of the backlash. So the question is about using humor. I think you have to know your audience really well. And I, and I do think it can be a gamble. I don't, I don't see a problem with humor. Um, I think 
you know, it's probably wise to do things like, let's stay away from politics, right, and areas that could really be a challenge. Um, but you saw in, in my own presentation, I try to stick with some humorous things because I think it gets a message across really well. But I try to, to, to keep it fairly benign. But you really have to know your audience depending on the kind of humor you're using. So, yeah. Other questions? Anybody else? Yes. How to get them to care? Yeah, because you know, I guess it relates to home. So the question has to do with, you know, how do you get people to care about the company's data? And the answer is, you may or may not be able to get them to care about the company's data. But if you can get in the habit of them understanding why it's so important to do it at home, it will become a habit, and they will start doing it at work, whether or not they think about it. Y you know, because at the end of the day, what people usually care about is themselves, their family. Um, you can use things like the, the consequences that I talked about, right? So if you have poor company reputation and it's a publicly traded company, their stock could fall, meaning there could be layoffs. I mean, you can take it to, the, to an extreme if you have to, but that's really, yeah, that's really negative. So I think you're better off trying to relate it back to what they care about day to day, and once you get them to understand that doing this in general is beneficial for them, they will just start doing it at work. That's at least what, what research has shown is that once people get in the habit of doing the right kinds of things, you just do it all the time, right? You're welcome. Other questions? Okay. Well, I can tell you that I don't necessarily know that I ever intended to wind up in information security despite my father's uh, job, but I can tell you that I'm very glad to be where I ended up, and I thank you very much for listening. <laughs>